Folks, before I lead in a word of prayer, I remind you, um, God bids us to come boldly, uh, sincerely but boldly before the throne of grace. Uh, we do not come to Mount Sinai, but we come to Mount Zion, uh, the heavenly city um, whose builder and maker is God, a myriad of angels, the scripture says. Uh, we're found in that grace, and so we come boldly this morning. Uh, let's unite our hearts in, in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your presence. And thank you that, you, that your heart uh, pants after us. Uh, you love us so, so very much. Uh, you delight in this time uh, to inhabit the praise of your people. Uh, you delight uh, to hear from us, and you bid us to come, and we do that, Lord, uh, sincerely this morning uh, with hearts humbled. I thank you uh, for uh, the thought that Harold shared uh, regarding your greatness and your majesty. Um, who is like unto you, O Lord? Um, how can we describe you? Uh, as the song says, indescribable, incomprehensible. And uh, yet we, we believe, Lord, uh, we come before you today, and we ask that, uh, that you would receive our worship and our praise, um, and that uh, it would bless your heart. And also, Lord, too, we pray that you would fill our heart uh, with the gladness of salvation, uh, the joy of the Lord. Uh, may that be our strength. Um, great peace and great joy and great hope. In a, in a time of desperation, uh, in a time where the world is uh, out of control, and yet, Lord, I guess it's always been out of control, but in a time where uh, it's crazy, and in a time where uh, tyranny reigns and sin reigns, and, and yet uh, we're ever mindful uh, that you're greater uh, than all of that, uh, you uh, reign over the kings of the earth. You're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we bless you, Father, that you're going to right every wrong someday. Uh, we bless you uh, as we look forward to your coming. And we pray that, um, um, we, we, we pray that as much as possible that we, we keep our own hearts. And yet we know uh, without you keeping our hearts, uh, it's futile. So, um, we give you our hearts again this morning, and uh, afresh, uh, may you speak to our hearts, may you renew our hearts, and may you encourage our hearts during this time. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, those of our congregation who are not here, uh, those who are shut in, um, and yet um, their heart uh, just so desires to be here as well. Uh, think of the shirtless. Uh, we lift them up this morning. Uh, think of uh, Sandy Sherman, Patricia, Fred, uh, the many, Lord, that just are struggling physically to uh, make it out. Uh, and also, Lord, those that are concerned about coming out, we pray that you would lift those concerns and, and that burden and uh, that they would find uh, great peace as they uh, trust you in all these things. Um, Lord, um, we uh, also want to lift up uh, the Moore family. Uh, thank you for Lauren being with child, and um, we give her to you, Lord, and the delivery and the baby in the next couple of weeks. Thank you that your timing is perfect, and um, uh, thank you, Lord, uh, that we can lift her up. We pray that uh, you would guide the hands of the doctors, that there would be no complications, and uh, mother and baby would be, would be well. Uh, we pray that you would continue to uh, inhabit uh, our worship and our praise this morning. Uh, we give you this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have our first reading of Scripture. Dave? The 
this morning's first scripture reading from the New Testament, from the book of 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 4 through 12. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1177. Again, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So our second reading this morning is from the 12th chapter of Romans, the entire 12th chapter. And it begins on page 1100 in the church Bible. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is the grace of prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, the words that I speak, may you give them life. Uh, may they be a life and marrow uh, to our hearts and to our minds and spirits and bodies today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, folks, uh, the last uh, couple of months I've ran into several believers uh, who have shared uh, about lacking purpose, and this is the reason for the message today. But they, they essentially said to me that life isn't worth living. Uh, they felt like they were not making a difference. You ever, ever feel that way? They were just existing, struggling to find purpose. Uh, you know, uh, I've felt that from time to time, truth be told. I think we've probably all felt that from time to time. Uh, doesn't make it right in our thinking, but we've felt that way. Just existing, struggling, not really feeling that we make a difference. It is so important that we get rid of the notion that we do not make a difference. You make a difference with friends. You make a difference with family. You make a difference with church family. And you make a difference in society, whether you realize it or not. But that's exactly what the devil wants us to think, amen? That we do not make a difference as the church or the family of God. That's not a good place to be. I've been there. It's not a good place to be. So this morning, I want to I talk about finding purpose renewed, because we all need purpose. Uh, Pastor Dow used to say, needed, wanted, useful. We all need to feel that. Uh, we all need to be spiritually renewed as well, do we not? Spiritual renewal leads to spiritual transformation. If we're not transformed, what does Paul say? If we're not transformed, then we are conformed. That It's implied. Be transformed, do not be conformed to the world. Take a, take a look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Because to be spiritually renewed leads one into the will of God. You know, a lot of times people run around and say, I want to know God's will for my life. Well, if we are spiritually renewed, God will lead us into that. It proves, spiritual renewal proves what the will of God is. That it's good and it's acceptable and that it's perfect. That's where God wants us to be in the will of God. Finding purpose renewed. It's doing the will of God, and it's being in the will of God. And, and now, if you think about it, doing and being comes back to purpose. All the time. Doing and being comes back to spiritual renewal. And, and it's not only important to be spiritually renewed, it's absolutely essential. Paul wrote about it in Romans 12 here. Peter implied it and talked about it. Being mindful that we're being built up as a spiritual temple. I have two box trucks for the business. They're, I don't know, uh, what do you say, Drew? About 38 feet, 39 feet long. Put 12 skids of freight in each box truck. They have to go in for preventative maintenance every six to 8,000 miles. You can push it up to 10, 
but we don't do that uh, anymore. Uh, we do it six to 8,000 miles, so we don't have issues. So, it, so the truck can be and do what it's supposed to be for the business. You take your computers, you take machines, they have to have preventative maintenance done or they don't work right, correct? You gotta get rid of the viruses, you gotta recalibrate machines if they're to function optimally. You need sleep bodily if you're going to be able to function. What is it like after, after about like uh, 38 to 40 hours people start can possibly hallucinate? If you don't get enough sleep, you need, you need rest. And we need spiritual rest and renewal as well. And if this is not happening, then we're going to get spiritually worn down. Been there, done that. And what happens is the, the mind begins to play spiritual and emotional tricks to the point where you're in the spiritual doldrums and you start to lack hope. And great despair can come upon your soul. And you feel less hopeful and you feel like you don't make a difference anymore. That life is not worth the living. And after a while, we question our purpose. We really do. And we go negative. We struggle to fight through the obstacles. Apathy sets in. I don't want to run into the brick wall anymore. I don't care. I don't want to do the drill. That kind of mindset, it's like living in an echo chamber. And it affects, it affects your bodily language, doesn't it? You know, remember years ago, Tom Brady lost the Super Bowl? I can't remember to who it was. But I'm telling you, from the time he walked out on the field, you could tell it wasn't Tom Brady. Bill, you know which Super Bowl I'm talking about, right? Super Bowl you're talking about. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he, you could tell right away. And the chiropractor that I was going to at the time, she said, oh, yeah, you could, it was written all over his body language. He knew. He knew that it was going to be a huge obstacle, a hurdle to overcome. Echo chamber, body language. And tell me that people aren't aware of that when we're in that mindset. Of course they are. Spiritual renewal, it's, it's essential if we don't lose our spiritual purpose. You know, and I was, as I was thinking about it, every single one of us at a certain point in time needs the Holy Spirit to stir our heart and our soul. Amen? We do. That's why we come to church. That's why we do Bible study. That's why we read the scriptures. That's why we take meditation and devotional time. And hopefully we, we try to read other stuff that stimulates the heart and the mind spiritually. And, and, and yet that's not enough. We need to serve. We need to share Christ. It's kind of like filling up a gas tank. You know, if you don't, if you don't empty it out, you can't fill it up again. Right? Building one another up. All those things go a very, very long way to encourage our own hearts. Do you know that when you share your spiritual gift with others, that that blesses your heart and fills you up? It's huge. And all these things work together to renew the heart and the mind and the spirit. And I can tell you that when we do these things, we are way better off as Christians than when we do not do these things. And I also guarantee you that when we do these things, God will eventually show up. I remember years ago, I think I said this years ago in a sermon, but I remember years ago going on vacation, I was tapped. And I sat in a church service for 26 minutes trying to find God. <laughs> and at the 26 and a half minute mark, he hit me right here. He showed up. Uh, there was another time where I was on vacation, and I went to, to after the fifth or sixth week, the church service. It was a lay person that God used to just lay me right out. And it was, I was blessed for it. 
But God eventually shows up, doesn't he? That's why we do it. In the last 18 months, as, as I'm getting older, but in the last 18 months, uh, I've started to do sudo, sud, I can't even say it, sudokus, right, ma'am? Is that how it is? Sudokus. I want to say sudo, sudokus. I always want to say it backwards. I say everything wrong. I'm from Philadelphia. No, Jerry, you say donkey right. <laughs> I say donkey right. That's, that's right. There's a little story behind that. Marie was on the pulpit committee years ago. And uh, when she heard me say donkey, she said he's a keeper. <laughs> okay. But I started to do so the Sudoku's so I could stimulate my mind. And they think God, and other kind of word puzzle games, but, and they can be addictive. But here's the, here's the point. I read an article a number of, maybe like probably about two years ago, where it talked about the need to mentally stimulate the brain and the mind, especially as you get older. Because what happens is, as we get older, intellectually and spiritually, emotionally, we get into ruts. And we get comfortable. And we don't want to change. But, but you know, the article talked about incorporating diversity. Kind of changing things up. That, you know, where you don't get into this rut. Uh, some ruts are tough to get out of. Uh, you know, we forget that variety is the spice of life. So the article talked about, you know, trying to spice it up. Uh, losing weight, that's something I did in the last year, also helps you feel better. Being more physically active, and I know it's, it's tough when we have, you know, physical ele uh, elements and things, uh, uh, things of that nature, but it does wonders for the mind, body, spirit. I can't wait until the weather changes and start to get out and walk. Amen? You know, it's a little bit nicer when it's warmer. The same thing is true in keeping a spiritual edge. You have to mix it up and change it up. And, and it's hard to keep that edge. It really, really is. But this is why we embrace and we engage meaningful spiritual activities that will help us through those very, very tough times. Think about this. Everything goes from order to chaos, does it not? So if you order your schedule this week, I guarantee you that something will throw your schedule off. If you order your spiritual schedule, there's always something that's going to throw the spiritual schedule out of whack. And that's why it's necessary to recalibrate. And what we have to do is we always have to bring it back to Christ. Because there's a lot of things that you can read out there that are of a spiritual nature that will actually take you away from the Lord. Will actually have you focus on things, everything else but Him. And so it's always about Christ. We have to bring it back to Him. This, this was Solomon's point in the book of Ecclesiastes. I mentioned this last month. That, you know, life apart from Christ is, is meaningless. It's hopeless. And so we always have to bring it back to him. Now, believe it or not, I'm going on my 31st year here. You know, people say to me, how long have you been at the church? And I say, sometimes some people will say too long. But, you know, 30, 31 years, if you, if you mark the church from the time of 1806 when, when they actually started to meet on Hill Street... That's 215 years. If you trace it back to a Baptist society in 1780, that's 241 years. And from the, building, from the time the building was built in 1832, it's 189 years. And so I take a look at my time here, and we've seen some highs, and we've seen some lows. And that's kind of been the ebbs and the flows of it. Highs and lows, highs and lows. Kind of like what you see in family life. And yet, I take a look at the church's existence, and it's had some really low lows way before I ever came here. But has not God been in that too? So when you're down in the spiritual doldrum, sometimes God is there, and that's where he wants to meet us. Has he not been faithful and used people during the lean years? over the last 241 
or 189 or 215 years, however you want to measure it? Of course he has. He's been faithful. God is always faithful. And you know that. You know, I, as I was preparing the message, I couldn't help but think of Joseph. Joseph, you know, the, you know the account. He was pitted by his brothers. You know, he was just gutted. Can you imagine your siblings throwing you in a pit? Leaving, wanting to kill you, leaving you there? And then they decided to enslave him. They sold him into slavery. And then he found his way in prison. What kept Joseph going? God. Renewing the mind. Joseph, I, I believe that Joseph had to go back to those dreams. He knew that God was in him. He knew it. Jo Joseph served faithfully and had purpose and never wavered. And that's why he is who he is in Scripture. How did he get through it? Renewing the mind. Trusting when he was able to do. And waiting upon God when he was not able to do. God used him mightily in the fat years and in the lean years. You know that. We have to believe that we make a difference. We have to believe that. You've got to personalize it. You've got to believe that God is using you for good where you're at and what you do. Or you're going to fall into that category of just existing and I'm not making a difference. Scripture tells us our times are in our hands, are in His hands. I choose to believe that God is going to use me because my times are in His hands. He's going to use me. And He's going to use you as well. Did, did you ever hear of the Tinkerbell effect? The Tinkerbell effect it comes out of the, the Peter Pan story. We've all seen Peter Pan, right? The, the, the classic original Mary Martin. One. And uh, recall Tinkerbell is this kind of, this fairy light, you know, in the room or what, but kind of like just dead. And so Peter Pan gets the audience to clap and to bring Tinkerbell to life, right? That's, that's the Tinkerbell effect. So Tinkerbell comes to life because it, because it believes in the audience. But it's, it's believing in something in the mind that's not really there. When, when we come to God, there's no Tinkerbell effect. We know that He is. And that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We know that He exists. It's, this is not the power of positive thinking. If God has touched your heart and your life, you know it. You know that the promises of God are rooted and grounded in the very words of Scripture. He upholds, he upholds all things by the power of His Word. Our believing is not in audiences and fairies. It's not in the Tinkerbell effect. It's for real. The life-changing, precious Word of God. I believe that when I open this, I know it transforms my heart and my mind, my heart and my mind. And doesn't it give you pause? Oh my goodness. And when we, when we do that, we have purpose in Him. And we have purpose in His cause. When we calibrate, we, we, we get renewed and we get energetic. Has not God called you into this grace? Now, if you've accepted Christ, God has called you and you have been called into this grace and you're saved. I trust that that applies to everybody here this morning. And so you come to Romans 8.28 and you know that God works everything together for good. Everything. Everything in your life and in my life and in the life of this church and even in the world ultimately is redemptive. God knows it all. Nothing, he doesn't miss anything. And he who began a good work in you, you know he'll complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. God finishes what he starts. 
And so as I was praying over this, I'm thinking, at the heart of our spiritual journeys and our calling is the belief that God is, that God has, and God will continue to use us for his honor and his glory. That's why he's called us and saved us. So yes, we all have purpose. We've been saved for a purpose. Think about this. The families that you've been been born into, that's no accident. All the personal and business and professional contacts that we have, those are for divine appointments. Kind of like woman at the well appointments. They are contacts for us to share the glories of Christ with. Our placement in society, where we live, where we work, what we do, who we socialize with, who our friends and neighbors are, it's all providential. There's no mistake. God has you where he has you for a divine purpose. Everything is redemptive. Everything is providential. Everything has a divine purpose. You have a purpose and I have a purpose. And, and we need to remember that. We need to, we need to embrace that. Uh, what does Peter say? Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's own possession. Those, those are incredible, incredible things, folks. Why? Why has he done that? So that we might proclaim the glories of Christ. That's why. Now, here, here's the problem. We don't always feel like we're making a difference, do we? And here's the problem. Feelings. Everyone struggles with feelings. You know, I, feelings are great when they're good, right? <laughs> Last night, my wife asked me if I wanted a bowl of ice cream. And I was like, oh, man, that's a great feeling. <laughs> and I said no. And I went to bed kind of spanked a little bit, but I'm trying to watch the weight. And it kind of, it's kind of been creeping up here in the, like the last month or two. And, and so, but feelings are great, you know? And, and God has given us uh, feelings. But, you know, you can't trust your feelings. One day they're high, one day they're low. Maybe the same day they're both high and low. And it could be all over the place. And so you get my point. Some, some days you're even too busy to think about how you feel, right? Scripture tells us every believer is a believer priest, a royal priest. Do you, think, do you think of yourself as a royal priest? No, that's exactly right. Sandy, Sandy, you're right. You're being honest. But whether you think of yourself like that or not, that's who you are. That's how God sees each and every one of us as children of God. And so we have access, do we not? We have access to a living God. We minister and serve Christ. And, you know, you don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to be able to do that. And you don't even have to be in ministry to have a pulpit. Everything, every, every, your life, your ministry, everything that you do, God, God gives you a ministry. You're a believer priest. That's who you are. You have a pulpit. Did you know that? Wherever you go, you have a pulpit. I happen to have this. But you have, you know, I, there's however many people are here this morning, that's how many pulpits leave this place. It's true. Martin Luther, the great Reformation leader, wrote a pamphlet coming off of the... Um, the church kind of being stymied in the, in the dark and through the Middle Ages, but it not really embracing the Bible. But Martin Luther, when he, when he started to read Scripture and understand justification by faith and you being a, a Christians being believer priests, he started to understand that every vocation was a calling and was a ministry before God. First Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
You know, years ago, I was doing street work leading up to vacation Bible school at the church that I got saved in. And I'm going door to door handing out VBS flyers, vacation Bible school flyers. And it was hotter than hot, and I'm tired and I'm sweaty. And I was getting some rejection. I don't want that. I don't want that. And, you know, so after a while, you know, you kind of get beaten down a little bit. I go to this one house, and this lady says, would you like a glass of water? I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> glass of water. Do you know, do you, I can't begin to tell you how that picked up my spirits, how that ministered to my, I believe that she did it because that was her way of participating. I believe that she did it in Jesus' name. I never saw that lady again. I'm sure that she's long deceased. But even a glass of water has a purpose. And this lady was retired. You make a difference. I don't care if you're working or if you're retired. Every single day, we are able to make a difference in Jesus' name, in someone's life. Whether it's to another believer, or to our neighbor, to an unbeliever, somebody we work with, somebody that we you know, are in a club with. So, so important. Uh, today, you know, in the digital world, isn't it all about having a big footprint? You know, every, everybody wants a big digital footprint, right? So the bigger the digital footprint determines the following or one's influence. It, it often determines position in business, industry, politics, ministry. And so, here, and, and so here's the thing. You have a bigger footprint, Advertisers are like that. And so now a lot of people flock to your way. And so what, what happens is it can also determine revenue. And so this is, this is where it goes. The, the, digital, the digital footprint leads to a mindset. If I have more people, I have a bigger following and bigger influence or pulpit. It also leads people into thinking that they're more important than other people. And conversely, it leads people into thinking, when they don't have a big digital footprint, that they're not important and that they really can't make a difference uh, in the world and with other people. Our, our church doesn't have a big digital footprint. My business doesn't have a big digital footprint. You don't probably have a big digital footprint. And so what happens is, you, you, you start to embrace this mindset of feeling powerless, helpless. For example, as I said earlier, how can I really make a difference? How can I change the world? I'm retired. I'm a small town pastor of 40 or 60 people. I don't have a big pulpit or digital footprint. I'm not Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or a US, how, how do I, US Senator. How do I make a difference? You know, I've, I've fallen into that pit of purposelessness. You know, you, because you start to say, well, little old me, what can I do? You know, running into the brick wall, kicking against the goads. And you, after, you just don't feel, 31 years you feel like, did you really ever make a difference? You know, don't most of us feel small and insignificant and unimportant in the world? You know, when you're in grade school and high school, your world's a little small. But man, when, after high school, when you're pushed out into that world, it's like, whoa. And it comes quick. And it's big and it's cruel. And you're like, little old me. Or little young me. I want to say this morning, do not underestimate your significance in the sight of Almighty God. I've had to work through that. Do not underestimate your value to God. Do not underestimate your position in the kingdom of God. Jesus was born in a cave-like stable, not a palace. And very, very insignificant, small, and unassuming place. And that birthplace made all the difference in the world. Do you think that person who owned that 
stable of humble means ever really knew. Maybe Joseph asked the guy, hey, can I use your stall? Maybe he did know. Or if he didn't know, maybe he heard the angels sing. And if he didn't hear the angels sing, maybe he heard later, secondhand, wow, God used my stable. It, it seems little and insignificant, but doesn't God show up in the most unassuming and little places? Of course he does. I want to ask you this question. How do you know that you and I will not touch or shape one of the great church leaders of tomorrow? We don't know that. Maybe we influence the next D.L. Moody or Billy Graham or George Whitfield or John Wesley. You don't know that. You know, at a certain point, those men were touched by other saints and God used them to be what they became. You don't know who you're going to touch. Let me ask you this. How do you know that God won't start a revival with you? Oh, little old me. I, God wouldn't use me. Why not? Why wouldn't he use this church? Why not? Maybe, maybe we don't believe. I don't have a big digital footprint, and neither do you. But you know what we have? We have access before the throne of grace. We have access to the throne of mercy. We have access to the throne of power. What, what more influence do you and I need in the world than to have access to the throne of grace? I don't need to be an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos. I don't need to be some politician. I don't need to have a big digital footprint. I can go right to God. That's all I need to do. So, finding purpose renewed, how does, what does that look like? We speak God's truth. We tell others about Him. We teach others when possible. We pray. We live for, to meet to live as Christ. And we love to the glory of Christ. That's what we do. That's finding purpose. And when we start to fall short of that, then our purpose wanes. That's, that's living with renewed purpose. And, and it's not about money and political position or clout. That, those are all worldly things. You know what makes a difference? It's the spiritual that changes the spiritual. It's the spiritual that changes the political. It's the spiritual that changes the physical. That's where it starts. And, we, and we, we have direct access. And, and, and I know I'm going on a little bit here, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not done. I've got a lot to share today. And, but you know what? I take a look at believers and good, law-abiding citizens. You know what they do? They totally disengage because they feel powerless and insignificant. I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to go down to town hall. Harold, your father used to go down to town hall in a cushion, right? Boy, they hated to see him come. Harold tells me stories. Oh, they hated to see Mr. Perry. Because he wasn't going to sit down. He was going to make a difference. But you know what I started to think? You know, so many people disengage. Do you know that that's the norm? That's not the exception. That's the norm. I heard a political commentator years ago say, for the, leading up to the Revolutionary War, one-third were engaged... They were ready to fight. One-third were neutral, sat on the fence. One-third said, no, I'm with England. Can you imagine if one-third of the believers and good citizens in our good country got engaged? Do you think our culture would be the way it is? I don't think so. But people are people. And sadly, what they do is they give up. They don't persevere. They retreat. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 9, uh, oh, the scriptures are incredible. 
The scripture mentions one of King David's mighty men, Eliezer. He's a great role model. He was the second of, of David had 37 mighty men. And these guys were like, pfft, these guys were like men's men, you know, the men's men of the men's men. Eliezer was second in the pantheon of the mighty men here. And the scriptures, he stood out. He was one of the three that stood out of the 37, right? The scripture says, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle. And the men of Israel had withdrawn. The army withdrew. But it says, Eliezer rose up and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and it clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people that fled, the soldiers, returned after him only to plunder the dead. In other words, they showed up after the battle was over. Eliezer stood with his king. Stood his ground. Think about this. Your hand frozen to the sword. That's a case of arthritis, I would think, right? What a, what a beautiful picture of perseverance. Not giving up. I, I have a friend uh, who wrote a devotional book. And to honor his father-in-law, he talked about his father-in-law being an Eliezer. He lived to 106 years of age. And he talked about how he clung to his sword. And how he affected so many lives for Christ. Not quitting, not giving up. To a ripe old age. What about Samson? Samson, you know, many of you know the account. Samson made a lot of mistakes in his service to God. What does Judges 16 tell us? He did not give up. His eyes were gouged out. Daily he walked the grinding mill for a couple of years. And in the end he prayed to God and he wanted to make a difference. And you know the story, right? The Philistines gather in the temple to worship their god, Dagon. And Samson says, as he's brought out, and they make sport in front of him, he says, let me feel the pillars, and he prays to God. He says, let me die, but let me have vengeance. And God brings the whole house down. Because Samson had the faith to believe and to not give up. What about Nehemiah? Hundreds of miles away, has a burden for the Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, the city, the, its walls, its people. He risks his life to talk to the king. And you know what the scripture says? When the king said, hey, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? The scripture says he prayed. He was fearful. You don't address the king. You know, you go before the king and you maybe ask something. He was fearful, but he prayed and he renewed his mind. And God gave him success. He travels to Jerusalem. He challenges the people to build the wall and to take a position on the wall. That's what he does. And all those saints that I've mentioned, don't they make a difference? Of course they do. They persevered. Have you heard of the... Uh, top-down, bottom-up, cloven piven model. Have you heard of that? If you watch the news, you may have heard of it. I'll, I'll tell you what it is real quickly. It's a leftist political strategy and model to collapse things, to crush things, top-down, bottom-up. Pretty much like what they're doing in our society today. That's what it is. The goal was disruption and collapse. And I started to think, you know, more than anything else, believers are positioned for the top down, bottom up. I mean, we've got God. We can make a difference if we engage. We have God's ear anytime we want, morning, noon, or night, 24 7, seven days a week. As we engage culture, as we humble ourselves and pray, as we do so with Christian purpose, and we do to the glory of Christ, I guarantee you. God will show up. I guarantee you he will. But we, we, we easily forget that. 
We easily forget church history and Old Testament history because it's full of bleak and depressing situations and stories where God's people are down and out. And sometimes it's 20, 30, 40, 50 years before God shows up and does anything. Or Old Testament to New, 400 years of silence. But did not God show up? What about all the believers during those hundreds of years? Or the 40 or the 30 or the 20 years? You've got you to gotta believe that you make a difference. That's why I'm here for 21 years. I've got to believe that I make a difference. There's something called the ripple effect. You know what the ripple effect is too, right? Everyone here has thrown a little stone into the pond when you're a kid, right? And you see the ripple effect. And it starts small. And it mushrooms. Both great awakenings in this country started with a few people. Two or three. The ripple effect throughout the colonies in the country. As I read the Gospels, Jesus Christ by himself, and then started out with 12, although one, was, one had a demon. Small, small movement. I always remind myself, so I had 40 or 60 people, Jesus had 12. I'm okay with that. But he lived with purpose to the will of God, and his very life was a definition of the ripple effect. Everything went out. Think of the ripple effect in your life. Can you imagine what kind of effect it can have? Very quickly, consider the Apostle Paul, Paul's conversion. Think of the effect that Paul had on culture and society. The missionary journeys that he undertook. And he found himself in the will of God. People got saved, churches sprang up, everything moved out. So I started to think about that. Because I read Paul's conversion... And it doesn't tell us that any saints prayed. But I start to think, you know, I'll bet you the early church, I'll bet you there were saints that said in a, in a, in a prayer, prayer closet or prayer meeting, God, I pray that I don't get caught by Saul the Pharisee. I pray, God, that you would save Saul the Pharisee. Lord, I pray that you would save him and you use him mightily for your kingdom. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us that. But why would that not be possible? Helen, you pray, you pray for the guy that owns the adult shop. I do. Right? There you go. That's how it happens. That's how it works. You know, you've got to believe that your prayers make a difference, your life makes a difference, your ministries, your pulpit makes a difference. What we do... In the grand scheme of things, you've got to believe it makes a difference. You've got to believe that God has you here for a purpose. You've got to believe that when you're sharing Christ with loved ones, and you never ever get a response, you've got to believe that it doesn't. God's Word doesn't return void. You've got to believe when you're engaging culture, God's Word doesn't return void. Speak truth, speak up, take a stand, be vocal with family, friends, neighbors. Make it about Christ. Make it about right and wrong. Try not to make it about a political party. But don't avoid sharing your beliefs. It is what it is. Take to your pulpit. Because God says that we have the ability to demolish spiritual strongholds. That wasn't limited to the Apostle Paul. Pray. Spiritually fight. You're, you're gifted to do that. Scripture tells us that. Find your place on the wall. You can't, you can't hide your light under a bushel, right? Didn't work very well for Jonah now, did it? Because God tracked them down, and you know the rest of that story. You know, too many people want to um, retreat into the monastery, so to speak. They don't want to engage. That's sad. No, Pastor, I, while I'm older, I, I cannot do, I don't move too well, I can't physically do it like, I, I got that, I can't physically do like I used to, I understand that. But Pastor Dow pretty much had the same problem. But he was a prayer warrior, limited but a prayer warrior. That can never be taken away. 
Never. Here you go. I didn't mention this today. You were given a uh, bulletin insert from the desk of Franklin Graham. I, I meant to show a little video today, but I knew I would have a long message. Um, the Equality Act, nothing equal, uh, equal about it. But you have a chance, read that, you have a chance to pick up the telephone and call your senator. Uh, now, I understand we're in a liberal state, and you know they want to do what they want to do, but maybe God will give them ears to hear. You don't know. I miss your husband, ma'am. He's a great man of God. You know what he always used to say to me? To encourage me? Because, you know, don't have a big footprint here. Pastor Dow would say some have numbers, but God has numbers that count. Right? Find purpose renewed in Jesus Christ. Stay the course. Do not retreat. Persevere. Do not give up. God doesn't call us to do it all. He just calls us to do and to be. Find purpose in that. He doesn't expect us to do it all. That's the beautiful thing about it. Amen? We do what we can. I'm done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, bless you for your word and bless you for our standing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we have a tremendous position in Christ and we have a place in your kingdom and may we uh, have the vision to understand that you've ordained a place uh, for us on the wall uh, to do our part. And may you give us the grace and the strength to be bold and uh, to not retreat in, uh, in our doing and our being. Uh, may we be uh, like Eli Ezar and stand our ground in the field. Uh, we bless you. We thank you for your word for this time and for these great saints that are here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.